Illinois Stories is brought to you by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by the support of viewers like you. Thank you. Hello, welcome to Illinois Stories. I'm Mark McDonald in Springfield at the recently opened National Museum of Surveying right across from the old state capitol. And this program is going to be very interesting to people who love history and who love the future because we're going to come back in this room and look at the history of surveying. But first, I want to show you a real wowzer in Springfield. It's going to be called the, Sci the Science Sphere. And I want to introduce Matt Parbs here because, Matt, you have a very interesting relationship with the sphere that we're about to see because you were just walking down the street one day and noticed the museum and said, I'd like to get to know those folks a little bit. And you got to know each other. And you, now you're an active volunteer here, right? Yeah, I'm now the <laughs> assistant director. How cool is that? Yeah. Um, but you're, you're a young man interested in, in technology. Mm -hmm. You recently graduated from UIS. And so you became familiar with the sphere pretty quick, didn't you? Uh, very quickly. Uh, I had uh, Jenny Dahl taught me all I needed to know about it. And it just all the possibilities wowed me. Uh -huh. So I just had to get involved because I mm -hmm. just couldn't let this opportunity pass. Now the sphere that we keep teasing, the sphere, <laughs> and we do it for good reason yes. because there aren't very many of them. Yeah. Springfield's home to one of the few spheres there mm -hmm. is. And it does remarkable things, doesn't yes. it? Yes. There's only 50 of them in the world, only 40 of them in America. And it shows wor the world and the universe in a perspective that no one can really imagine until mm -hmm. you actually walk into the science on the sphere room. And it's a function or it's a, it's a, a property of the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA? Correct. Is that NOAA, right? Yeah. Okay. And this is its home. And so the, the, the data that is being fed to this sphere, in some cases, is real-time data yep. that's coming from NOAA. We can see what the atmosphere looks like right now. We can see what the ocean temperatures are right wow. now. We can see what, you know, even in the universe, what is happening right now from mm -hmm. satellites. Wow. Yeah. As I said, we're going to come back into this room, and Bob Church, who knows all about serving, is going to take us through some of the history. But let's go see the newest stuff first, okay? Okay. All we'll right. Do. Into the sphere. Yes. We'll go in to see the world from 435 miles. <laughs> well, I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. Okay, Matt, visitors to the museum get to pretend they're astronauts. Yes. You know, because this is looking at Earth from space. Mm -hmm. It's what Earth looks like 435 oh, miles up into space. It's just beautiful. When you bring visitors in here, sometimes you have prepared programs, narrated programs for mm -hmm. them. I'm going to ask you to start one, and then I'm going to ask you, we're not going to watch the whole thing, but then I'm going to ask you to show me some of the more popular programs uh, that, that NOAA sends you about the Earth. Yeah. Start off with what's called, I think it's called the Blue Planet? Uh, the Blue the blue Planet is the first video that we show, but this okay. one's called the Blue Marble. This is the Blue, blue Marble. Marble. Okay. Yeah. They call it the Blue Marble because the Apollo oh. 17 crew said Earth from 435 miles looked like a clear blue marble. Mm. It is beautiful. It is beautiful. And this is a series of satellite images from May to September 2001. Uh -huh. And all it is is put in a normal JPEG file, uh -huh. a normal picture that you save on your computer, and a computer splices it into four regions, uh -huh. and it sends you know, region one to projector one, and we have four projectors. Uh -huh. and so each projector gets a quadrant, and that's how we get the picture. Uh -huh. The globe itself is stationary. Yeah, the globe's not yeah. turning. Yeah, it's, the images are, are making yeah. it appear that it's turning. Yeah, it's okay. the projectors and wow. the computer system at work. Okay. We do nothing. <laughs> Start off the blue planet for us. Yeah, um, blue planet. Okay, and this will have some sound. Yes. Water defines our world, from shaping the surface of the planet to supporting all life on Earth. Water in abundance makes Earth remarkably different from its neighbors in the solar system. Mars is a frozen desert. Venus is hot and dry. The moon is both cold and hot and waterless. And then there is Earth, often called the blue planet because from space we see that most of our planet's surface, nearly 71%, is covered in water. From out here, Earth's blue, watery surface appears calm and still. But Earth's water is constantly moving in a complex and unending cycle, shifting between solid, liquid, and vapor, 
moving between Earth's sky, its surface, and the ground beneath our feet. Water is on the move in the atmosphere. Water vapor, usually invisible, but colored gray in this animation, moves heat from the equator toward the poles. Okay, man. Okay, I wish we could watch this whole segment, Where but we warm, can, of course. Moist air but of course, visitors to the museum would get a chance to see that yeah. whole thing. We have to do an abbreviated version, though. Okay. And I asked you earlier, show me the stuff that just wows people, you know, yeah. when they look at it. What do you want to start with? The lights, the lights uh, from the sky? Yeah, we'll start off with Earth at night. Okay. And what we always like to point out is it kind of highlights the economic disparity of the world. Because right now we have, here in India and in China, we have two billion point people. Point out China for us. China is over here. Okay. And here's India right okay. here. Two yeah. billion people. Two billion people, and that's just how much light they have. And then mm -hmm. we come over down here to look at Europe, oh, which kind of looks like a gecko. We always like it does, doesn't it? It looks yeah. like Western Europe, yeah. yeah. And so how bright Western Europe is, and then compared to Africa. And then we... Here's, here, let's point. Uh, yeah. This is all of Africa, Africa. right here, and mm -hmm. almost no electric light. Correct. And the only real light is down here in South oh. Africa. Mm -hmm. And so it's just kind of... There's South America. Let's stop there. Yeah. There's South America. You can see on the coast. Yep, coast. And the reason that is because wherever you are in the world, 50% of people live within 50 miles of the coast, mm -hmm. just because of the way our economic system is How about the up. U.S.? And the U.S. is very, very, just it's stark because you can see each individual city and you can see mm -hmm. the northeast compared to the west because the west, of course, is the Rocky Mountains yeah. and the deserts. Can you rotate it down? Show us St. Louis and Chicago. Yep. Rotate it down if you can. And then whip it over here. And you have Chicago yeah, and St. Louis. Louis. Yep. And you can yep. see the actual, and if you get really close when you come into the museum, you can see like the highways, because all the highways are straight lines mm -hmm. on this. Mm -hmm. And so that's the first thing we get, that's kind of the hook of the, the many data sets. This is yeah. just one out of 250. And then we move on to a data set that we created that we kind of talk about, but this is what we can do too, that you can create your own data sets. Okay, what'd you create here? This is the world population density. Mm -hmm. And so we sat down and Jenny Dahl created this map herself with just a normal mapping software and we can put it up. And this is what we really want to do with students. We want students to come in mm -hmm. and create their own maps and we can do wow. you know, show and tell basically and mm -hmm. open houses for students. And so... Now you can also do physical events that are going on in the world, uh -huh, physical. earthquakes, tsunami, yep. those kinds of things. Show us what yeah. you've got in that, in that regard. Okay. Uh, some of the physical events, the one that is very stark, that just is visually pleasing is the airplane traffic in the world. <laughs> and so there's 84,000 flights in a day. And we and just... Each one of those little contrails yes. represent an airplane. Mm -hmm. huh? Okay. And we can see, because we got lucky here, with daylight breaking over to Europe, and just see with daylight coming across the world, just the explosion. All the planes yeah. going into Western Europe. Yeah. Look. Look at and just the logistics <laughs> of that. At any given point, there's 5,000 planes in the air. Yeah. And we can watch daylight break over the Atlantic and just the explosion of airplane. And America itself is really cool to watch. Let's because, turn that down. Yeah. yeah. And we all use this with a Wii remote, and so you can manipulate it. And just, we got the explosion at basically 6 a.m. Uh-huh. So like, and I like to point out also, we can just see why O'Hare is the busiest because no matter what point of the day it is, O'Hare is constant traffic. A bright traffic. gold color. Yes, you can see the planes color. going in that are remarkable. Yeah. And it's just, it's just amazing to watch. And I also like to point out, because I'm a history nerd, that to get to Asia, we go over basically what we did 10,000 B.C., mm -hmm. the Bering Land Strait. But this time we go over it with planes instead of by foot. I can see them all going yeah. north from Alaska. Look mm -hmm. at that. Yep. Yeah, I just find that just kind of the connection <laughs> we have with 10,000 BC mm -hmm. to be amazing. Uh -huh. um, we can move on to the next one that we like to show, which is we call it real time earthquakes. Uh -huh. In the past 30 days, it shows every earthquake that happened. The size of the circle is the magnitude. So, of course, the bigger the circle is, the more powerful it's going to be. Now, you've got it uh, trained on California mm -hmm. right now. Yeah. And is it, this is real time? These earthquakes are going on? They're going on in the past 30 days. Wow. So it's what's happened uh, in the past month. And so we can go, it will stop this morning at 10 a.m. And so, like, with mm -hmm. the colors, we see here, they're only, they're 10 to 15 feet deep. That means we will feel them. But if it's more like a purple color, 
most likely we're not going to feel the earthquake. So this is every day. Every, what we're seeing every day yes, in California, they're day. shaking, and, and yeah. they don't even report it. They, they don't, don't even care because they're you know they're size three or four. Yeah. And you know we had that one a few years ago. We freaked out. Yeah, and that's a daily yeah. occurrence I'll for someone gone. in California. Earthquakes every yeah. day. And if you want, I can show you the Pacific Rim. Okay, the let's land. do. It. Yeah. That's why they call it the Ring of Fire. Because we have constant earthquakes over here, and we can see the one that happened on uh, October 26th in Indonesia. That was a 7.7. There it is, Whoa. right there. Yeah. yeah. And so we can see that's what a real earthquake's like, mm -hmm. and not the little ones we had in California. Right. Right. Yeah. Now, oftentimes, an earthquake out at sea will cause cause what they call a tsunami, mm -hmm. and and that's of course a, a tidal wave that just starts. Its rings just get bigger and bigger and bigger, uh, and sometimes it can very deadly. Yes, and we actually have the 2004 tsunami. We can show it, and it's a 9.9 .9 earthquake in the epicenter in the Indian Ocean right here. Mm -hmm. And that's the one that killed, if you remember, 250,000 people in 2004 and right. caused billions right. and billions of dollars of damage. And so we can see it, what happened, right after it starts. So you can put it Boom. in motion. Yep, and there's the motion. That's the 9.9 wow. .9 earthquake, and you can only go up to 10. And then within 24 hours, we whip it around, and it hit both coast oh my goodness of the americas and hit the east coast more it's gone all around the world yeah. in 24 hours in 24 hours it goes through the entire world can you can you do that for us again can yep. you bloom that up for us again we got here it's come so now america is sitting silently on mm -hmm. the december 26th and then within 24 hours on both coast wow there is reports of 35 foot waves there is urban legends of 50 foot plus waves. Mm -hmm. And I always end with the story of the animals knew the tsunami was coming. So all the animals in Indonesia islands ran to higher ground. Mm -hmm. and I've always wondered how they sense that and what we lost and that we can't sense that anymore. Right. Whereas all the animals are able to sense it. Right, wow. Yeah. And Remarkable. Then the next one we always go into is we go into the hurricane data. Okay. Yeah, and that's really important because it's the 2005 hurricane season that was the oh, most. Oh, we remember that one. Yeah, which was the most, had the most hurricanes in a year. There was at least 28 named storms, and there was many, many different hurricanes. But the ones that we always remember that are coming up are Katrina, and we'll show Katrina coming up here in a few. But it goes through every storm. Mm -hmm. and of course, it goes to Katrina, Rita, Wilma, these are the ones that we probably remember the names mm -hmm. of. But there was so many more that kind of got lost. In a normal hurricane season, we would remember Irene. Right. But the problem is we had back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back category yeah. fives. Well, we're still on Irene, but yeah. I have a feeling now it's the 18th or 19th of August there, and you know who's coming up. Yes. <laughs> Katrina's coming Katrina's up. Katrina's coming when, up. When she does, point her out for yep. us. Katrina's starting right here. She's all hurricanes start off the coast of Africa. They come over the Atlantic Ocean, and they hit the warm air of the Gulf Stream. And so we start to see her form here. She's coming over, and there's the eye. Ooh. And I, it's, when you're sitting here, I like to point out, I don't like to point out many of the hurricanes, because I like to try them to get to see it, because then the eye always mm -hmm. pops out and scares people. Because mm -hmm. that is a huge eye of mm -hmm. a storm. And there she goes. And there she goes. And then we were talking about what follows up, is you have Maria, and then of course Rita hit. What we were talking about, we thought it was a couple mm -hmm. days later, it was actually a month later, but mm -hmm. Katrina just lasted in our consciousness. Ophelia is interesting because she hits the coast twice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then we have Philippe and Rita back to back, and there is Rita yeah. hitting. And Rita slammed them before they, they got over Katrina, and it yeah. was really, really wasted the Gulf Coast. Yeah, anyways. and it's, uh, Rita is really sad just because they, I always point out that more people died in the evacuation just mm -hmm. because of the, the, they had the mental images of Katrina, so everyone in Houston tried to get out. Yeah. And, My goodness, man, this is yeah. so beautiful and so yeah. instructive. And this is just the tip of the iceberg for what we can show. Like, mm -hmm. we have 250 other data sets that we can show. Wow. And anything from the cosmos down to sea turtles migrating, mm -hmm. we show that there. And it's just really neat to see the animal migrations in comparison with ocean currents compared to, you know, celestial beings. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's just the possibilities are endless. Yeah. Thank you, man. This You're has welcome. been great. Yeah. Well, Jim Roth, we're looking at one of our country's first surveyors, certainly our first president, one yes. of our first surveyors, George Washington. And here in the media room, this is the first place where people who come to the museum usually stop for an orientation video and to get a look at some of the oldest material that the museum has. 
you're the president of the board Correct. of the museum, and yeah. you've been a surveyor your whole life. Yes. So you, it's, this is dear to your heart. Yes, it? it is. Yeah. 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 Um, I want to, before we talk about you, I want to talk about about George Washington a little mm -hmm. bit. You're very pleased to have this display in here, yes. which starts with Sir Washington's own survey of his Mount Vernon property. Correct. Wow. Yeah, he, uh, uh, like a lot of older uh, uh, landowners in the olden times, uh, he did a lot of his own surveying. He had to mm -hmm. find out what he owned, in particular in this case, uh, he grew tobacco, and he needed to know how much, how many acres in tobacco he had, mm -hmm. uh, and that was kind of the basis for he and Jefferson and and others of his time to get involved in the technology or the uh, the process of surveying. And uh, you know what we're showing here is, is his original property, and then what has happened over the years to that physical property. Mm -hmm and how it's changed and is depicted in the various plats mm -hmm. that are on file uh, for uh, what describes this property. Uh, so this whole exhibit was developed by the uh, Library of Congress. Mm -hmm. We were fortunate to get the whole thing so we could display it here. And it sort of gives anybody that comes to the museum an introduction into surveying and possibly what it might mean to them. You know, everyone that uh, owns property uh, has experienced this same sort of thing. Mm -hmm. If you look back in history, and sometimes you have to do that to find out the uh, actual acreage of a piece of property or the original mm -hmm. acreage and how it got subdivided and all those things. I mean, you know, sometimes you call that an abstract. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, gotcha. this is a this is a um, uh, a depiction, basically, uh, in drawing form or in plat form of what an abstract was, mm -hmm. uh, except minus the ownership. I, I want to ask you a little bit about locating the museum here and, and the struggle. Mm -hmm. It took several years, yes. not only to get the, the move made, because yeah. you knew that it was going to be moving here, but to just get the doors open. Yep. It, was, it, it took some time, didn't it? Yeah, well, uh, you know, Bob Church got uh, the idea because he was involved with a group of uh, in Michigan that, that owned or had a, a surveying museum. Mm -hmm. And he came to me and said, we ought to bring this to Springfield. And he explained a little bit about it, and I agreed with him. We, I mean, this should be in Springfield when you look at the connection between surveying and Lincoln and sure. the Lincoln Museum and library mm -hmm. and, and, and all that stuff. And so... Uh, you know, because of my uh, uh, workings with folks in the community and tourism and whatnot, we put together a pitch. And uh, actually the tourism people uh, presented that to the folks in Michigan and we sold them. And so the museum was moved here. Well, we knew that a museum, which that one was based on on historical stuff and old equipment and, you know, things mm -hmm. that people, it was actually you know, the way things used to be done. Mm -hmm. Well, we knew that wasn't going to really entice a lot of people, so we had to build around that. So that's what uh, we've done here. Mm -hmm. And um, we were on track, uh, I think we did that almost four years ago now. And, of course, what's happened with the economic downturn and surveyors, which are principal donors at the time, uh, were hit hard. Sure. Sort of anybody tied to the housing market, mm -hmm. which... Uh, most surveyors are it were hit very hard yeah. uh, compared even to the average. So your donors so, weren't, yeah, weren't able to come through the way up, they wanted yeah. to. Yeah. We've had a few, uh, some folks from California came through, uh, and yeah. uh, some others, and so. Uh, but we're we're basically on that shoestring, and we're, yeah. we're we're operating there. But we're moving forward. We think we're moving in the right direction, and the you know so in order to um, expand the uh, impact of the museum, particularly in the community. Uh, we obtained the Science on a Sphere exhibit, which you know, you've know you seen and, and, and is really the, the central um, uh, exhibit that we have here. And, but all of the um, information about surveying and the history of surveying, the connection to Lincoln and Jefferson and others in the country, Lewis and Clark, for example, are all lead up to um, the uh, concept of what's happening in the, in the area of surveying and in the broader sense, mm -hmm. you know, the sciences and, and others. We sort of look at the museum as a way to connect history, math, and science to the real world, to the people that come here and see it. Mm -hmm. that's, that's kind of our uh, mission, if you will. So. 
you know, I'm not real big on missions and all that, but that's that's mm -hmm. what we're trying to do. And I think we've done pretty well at it so far. Got to keep going, though. Well, Bob Church, long before George Washington, they were establishing locations of things, landmarks, properties, boundary lines, etc., mm -hmm. all the way back to Egypt. Egypt, correct. Yeah, this is a mural that we start out uh, talking about the history of surveying. And the Egyptians, supposedly every time the Nile would flood, the people would lose their landmarks. Mm -hmm. So they would hire a group to come in and resurvey or relay out those boundaries. They were called rope stretchers because, in fact, they used a rope. They had different knots tied in at different intervals, and that meant measurement to them, and they could recreate where the boundaries were. Wow, every time the Nile flood, which yes. is probably pretty frequently. Pretty frequently, oh, right, man. right. They were also the inventors of the plumb bob and other things to, uh, to, to show things that are level mm -hmm. and plumb, and uh, they were really great inventors for surveying. Mm -hmm. You know, surveyors have a joke. They say that, you know, Mount Rushmore is three surveyors and another guy. That's correct. Yeah. That's well, right. we, have some, we have some busts here on this, on this mural mm -hmm. of, of, some of, uh, some of those surveyors, some of those presidents right. we're talking about. George Washington on the right. Right. George Washington, when he was 16 years old, he and Joshua Fry went to the northern neck of Virginia and did survey work. Uh, also, this is uh, Benjamin Banneker, an African-American free slave from Baltimore, Maryland. Mm -hmm. His grandmother taught him to read, write, and do math, and he was a surveyor, a mathematician, astronomer, and an author. Mm -hmm. And along with Andrew Ellicott, uh, who was a graduate of West Point, and in fact is buried at West Point, those two did the field surveying of the District of Columbia in 1791. Oh, hey, darn. The next is uh, Jefferson. Mm -hmm. Jefferson's father, Peter, was a surveyor for the Crown even before the Revolutionary War. And then Thomas Jefferson became a land surveyor. Mm -hmm. uh, Jefferson is also uh, the one that created the, what's called the Rectangular Survey System, which is this grid system that was used from Ohio all the way to the West Coast. Uh, the reason he wanted to, uh, invented this system is because in, in Washington and Jefferson surveys, they did what's called the meets and bounds system, which meant they went from an object to an object to an object mm -hmm. to an object and back to the beginning. Well, what happens if somebody moves that object? You can't go back and recreate that mm -hmm. survey. So Jefferson was smart enough to realize that, and he came up with the rectangular grid system. These squares are called townships, not government townships, mm -hmm. but survey townships. They are six mile square. The reason they use six miles, they figured a settler could walk to a meeting and back uh, in the same day within that six mile square. <laughs> also, Jefferson was smart enough, these six mile squares are, con are, uh, are laid out then in, in 36 one mile square sections. Mm -hmm. And wanting to promote, e to promote education, he laid uh, section 16, which is kind of in the middle of the township, as what's called the school section. That section had to be used for, to either build a school, or if they sold it, they had to use the money to build a, sco a school in another section. Mm -hmm. So he was also prom promoting education at the same time. Just up over your shoulder here, we're looking at the great explorers, Lewis and right. Clark. Of course, they had to be surveyors because right. they were going to lay down the information the, of, uh, of the great uh, uh, a purchase, right? The Louisiana Purchase. The Louisiana Purchase, and actually they were explorers and they were map makers. Mm -hmm. uh, they used a sextant to do their work to, to find out where they were. In fact, Jefferson sent them to Andrew Ellicott to learn how to use a sextant mm -hmm. to be able to properly uh, map out where they were. These murals are fantastic. Let's, let's move over here for just a second. Okay. You've got more than murals in here. Oh, yes. This is, a, is an instrument which is very much like the one George Washington would have used, I guess. Correct. These are uh, compasses, what's called a surveyor's compass, uh, that would set on the top of either a tripod or what's called a Jacob staff. They would look through the two veins and they would look down at the compass and mm -hmm. that's how they would turn their angles and, uh, and then they would measure their distances from that point. This whole case is full of that same era of equipment, isn't Correct. it? Correct, yeah. Uh, everything in it, is, I think, except the one chain down there, uh, is uh, mm -hmm. the vintage of uh, Washington and Jefferson. Now, in these parts, you can't talk about surveying without talking about Abe Lincoln. That's right. And that's this wall over Correct. here. Correct. Uh -huh. uh, like I say, after, after the Revolutionary War, the United States owned what was called the Northwest Territory. And in those days, 
two out of every three people lived within 50 miles of the East Coast. Well, having the land out in the Midwest, where we're at now, Jefferson wanted to put that land up for sale. He needed it for two reasons. We, we won it from the war, mm -hmm. so he wanted to occupy it. And the other thing that happened is they had to pay off the Revolutionary War. So they put the land up for sale, and you had to buy 160 acres at $2.25 an acre. Mm -hmm. Well, no one had that kind of money, so they reduced it to, you had to buy 80 acres at $1.25. Mm -hmm. So Lincoln, uh, the, the surveyor in Sangamon County, John Calhoun, was very busy. He went out to New Salem, asked Lincoln to become a surveyor. Lincoln said, well, I know nothing about surveying. Calhoun said, yes, but they, know, they tell me you can learn anything. <laughs> so what happened was uh, Calhoun provided Lincoln with a couple of books. This is of the same printing, an 1813 printing of one of the books that Calhoun gave Lincoln. Lincoln probably went to mentor Graham, mm -hmm. the school teacher at New Salem, and, taught, and worked with him about how to do surveying and how to do the math. These are, this case shows mm -hmm. the type of equipment that he would have used, mm -hmm. the compass, wow. Jacob's staff, uh, chain, chaining pins. Mm -hmm. Lincoln did uh, five town surveys, four road surveys, and about 35 property surveys between 1833 and 1837. There is a lot more to see here than we can show you in a 30-minute program. The National Museum of Surveying is open Tuesday through Saturday from 10 to 3, or if you have a group, call ahead for an appointment there is an admission. With another Illinois story in Springfield, I'm Mark McDonald. Thanks for watching. Illinois Stories is brought to you by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by the support of viewers like you. Thank you. For a DVD copy of the program you've just seen, send 1995 to Network Knowledge, P.O. Box 6248, Springfield, Illinois 62708. Be sure to include the program name, subject, and when the program aired. You can also order with your credit card by calling 800-232-3605.